I think one of the big conversations around the idea of retirement needs to start with the focus that so many Aussies are really on their way to the pension. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker. We're heading back to Lake Weirdo to talk about how to retire functionally so we can have an awesome bloody life. And I tell you what, uh, we need to tackle this question. I've been talking a lot about real estate lately, so I thought I'd put the break on the real estate conversations, see if we can go back into a little bit when it comes to mapping out what retirement might look like in our world. It's a huge topic. There's so much to cover. I can't wait to talk about it. Hey, I got some really good feedback from my last episode about the different property markets available to property investors. Heaps of emails came through, little chats and also some comments. So thank you very much. I actually got one comment. Do I actually have a real estate book that real estate investors can read? Um, Well, here's a scoop for you. I do. I've got a real estate book. If you want to jump onto Amazon and make the people at Amazon even more wealthy, you can Uh, The book is called The Money Magnets of Property Investing by Sam Saggers. That's me. Uh, The book itself uh, came out just as coronavirus hit. And actually, a lot of the insights into what is unfolding in the real estate market now are mentioned in the book. So feel free to jump on to Amazon. Uh, The founder and CEO of Amazon is struggling, so he would appreciate you spending some money on his website and uh, buying this particular book. I think it retails anywhere from $20 to $30, depending on the Australian dollar buffering. It's print on demand, uh, but it's full of great information. There's sort of 300 odd pages there. You can read if you're a reader and you can get some insights into uh, really how to go and create wealth for yourself inside the real estate market. Hey, I tell you what, I just had the Pfizer jab, uh, so I'm doing this podcast a little bit tingly. My DNA is being transformed as we speak. Um, I'm just hoping that certainly when I end up catching coronavirus at some point, uh, my uh, symptoms are less severe and uh, as a result of taking the weird Pfizer. But anyway, uh, that's me, other than my Gopnik dog, has made it across the finish line and is now a family member. Yes, Rafi the dog is very lovable and uh, we've decided to keep him and uh, you'll probably see Rafi around soon. Uh, Certainly he'll be following me about when I do my daily videos and so forth. Anyway, that's enough catching up. Raffy the dog's good. Uh, I'm doing this on Pfizer. And we're here to talk about what retirement might look like for you. And of course, how you can either avoid Lake Weirdo, or if in fact you like the idea of parking up the caravan at $16 camper van sites, Lake Weirdo may just be the place for you to enjoy your golden years of retirement. I think one of the big conversations around the idea of retirement needs to start with the focus that so many Aussies are really on their way to the pension. Out of, you know, 100 people born in Australia, 75 people either pass away before the age of pension or end up on the pension. So three quarters of society or thereabouts today uses the Australian pension system to fund them, look after them in their golden years. And I tell you what, if you're not across how much the pension is, it's $36,000 per annum per couple. It's $24,000 per person or if you are a single 
right? So $36,000 a couple, $24,000 if you're a single. I would imagine a lot of old people get divorces just for the sake of trying to increase uh, their ability to get the pension. No doubt um, you uh, would probably try and think about that if you were in the pension system, right? The fact that you could squeeze another 10 grand out of taxpayers if you can do something a little bit tricky may actually help you in retirement. 75 out of 100 Aussies stuck on the pension system. And I think I wanted today to circle back to the idea of wealth building. I've done a lot of talk of recent times around the real estate side of it. But real estate is just a vehicle, right? It's a vehicle to create wealth. That's the only purpose of it. Um, And what that wealth looks like is actually a bit of a journey. And again, a lot of people struggle with the fact that real estate is something that takes a while to own, uh, own outright, certainly from the bank, and certainly to live off passive income is a big journey when it comes to real estate from woe to go. Typically, most people, of course, start out with real estate, highly leveraged, borrowing lots of money from the bank. They have to go on a big journey to get to the other side of this thing called wealth creation. And a lot of that takes 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years to do. I've been a property investor now for 25 years. I've done over 22 different strategies when it comes to property investment. And I do it fundamentally to create a retirement. That's really the only purpose of why I am an investor. And I think a lot of people bullshit themselves through their economic work career. You know, when you think about your life, it's kind of divided into three parts. The first 30 years, you're trying to get to know yourself. The second 30 years is like this really critical part where you've got to go to work, exchange your time for money and turn that money into assets that creates more money. And this financial literacy around this part is so broken in Australia that most people obviously are not successful at it because the pension statistics don't lie. Just go and check out the ABS statistics uh, when you account for people who have passed away and the people currently on the pension as a proportion of retirees. It is horrendous just how many people cannot self-fund their world. And I think a lot of it comes down to what I refer to as bullshit economics. There is so much bullshit. People either love being bullshitted to or they create their own version of bullshit which holds them back from doing simple things such as property investing. And it's the lack of responsibility around investing in general that often leads to people just spending years and years and years without doing anything at all when it comes to working their money. You know, money in a capitalist society is just designed to be put into the market to create more money. That is the basic principles of capitalism. Uh, We do not live in a socialist economy. And even though the government here in Australia is very responsible and does give people a helping hand, uh, it is minuscule compared to what the cost of living actually is. When you think about the pension being $36,000 per couple, um, hey, look, that is not keeping up with the cost of living. That has absolutely no chance, even if it was to grow um, you know, at an index rate, It's just not keeping up with the cost of living. Have you been to Coles lately? Uh, Have you been to IGA? Have you been on a holiday? It is expensive. Have you updated your television, updated your car? All of the costs around society with inflation are going to blow apart the idea that you should uh, breeze through life without contemplating what retirement looks like. So I want today's show to focus in on retirement and it is not about having the most. I will uh, absolutely come out and explain that I do not with this podcast to create 
a dynamic where if you've messed up economic decades of your life, that it's kind of over for you because it's certainly not any one year, three year, five years, 10 years, you can dramatically change your life. The first seven years of my economic life, I was broke. The next seven years of my economic life, I was starting to work out how to become uh, wealthy. Uh, The balance of my economic life, I've been fairly well off. It can change quickly. And for most people with a job, it's certainly not too late to create and plan a bit of a retirement. So we're going to touch on that, but I do want to focus in on bullshit economics because I coach a lot of people, I speak to a lot of people, and a lot of people bring their bullshit to me. And I can tell you what, it is this stuff that kind of derails people uh, from actually creating financial freedom. Because financial freedom just takes a little bit of ingenuity a little bit of investment and a little bit of time. And really, that's all it fundamentally is. It is actually so boring that most people just can't actually stomach it because of the time it takes to become wealthy. And again, I hear it all the time. You know, uh, here's some examples of bullshit economics. Uh, I've got a great penny stock which I can invest in, it's going to double overnight should I throw uh, my life savings at it. Bullshit. It's not going to work out for you. Just give up on that shitty idea. I hear my brother is inventing the next search engine. It's going to be like Google. Bullshit. Google exists. Uh, Get over yourself. Move on, man. Like this is the stuff that, again, just throws people sideways. And I hear this stuff so much, man. Like it drives me crazy because, you know, the foundations of wealth are are built over a period of time. And that is just as anything inflates over a period of time, so does wealth inflate. I hear things like the real estate market is doomed. Uh, Well, mate, who cares if it goes up or down? It's the return. It's the rent that you live on in retirement. And I'll tell you what, so far real estate's been pretty good. So your prediction of the doom and gloom, um, it hasn't necessarily come true so far. And I'll tell you what, uh, I certainly have had many, uh, I guess, player haters on my Facebook lives and things like that going, you know, you're a scumbag, mate, like you're... Um, you know, you're, uh, you know, advocating buying real estate, you know, real estate, you, you know, just it's it's making it hard for the battler and stuff like that. And I tell you what, man, like, seriously, like, a lot of people start to turn their misery into just their conversation piece. The fact that they're not sorting themselves out, they will just come up with some sort of, you know, something to hold on to, to advocate that they're important about some sort of piece of this puzzle that it's called, uh, you know, called wealth. Uh, You know, so I hear it all. I hear tenants ruin property, so why would you buy a property? Well, that's not true. That's just more bullshit economics. Tenants are great. They look after properties for the most part. And you know what? It's a thing called insurance. So again, get over yourself, get investing. Um, whether it's the real estate market, the share market, your superannuation, invest, invest, invest. Um, I hear all sorts of bullshit economics. Something happened to me as a kid and, you know, I, I, I just can't, you know, get my life together. You know, more bullshit. Just go and sort your shit out, man. Like, that's what uh, being a grown-up is all about. Um, you know, I hear things like, oh, you know, I'm going to go invest in the US real estate market. Oh, great, mate. That's a great idea. You moving to America? No, not moving to America. Okay, well, that's really going to work out for you. Again, more bullshit economics. And I think the more people, uh, the more that people basically spend time in this state where they're just confused as to what they want, really, the many more years they kind of waste becoming ultimately the millionaire they basically want to be. And, 
you know, I've got so many millionaires that I hang around with, which are just silent millionaires. They're people you would have, you know, you wouldn't guess are owning six, seven properties. They're cab drivers, flight attendants, um, they're, you know, school teachers. They're just normal people that take a long-term viewpoint to a real estate investment and they get the results. So uh, the fact I've been doing this 25 years, I can tell you I've seen people pop out the other end so financially successful from real estate investment. And I've certainly met a lot of people along the way who love talking about stuff but never actually implement anything. So let's design your future and let's give up the bullshit and let's move into some critical questions like what does your retirement actually look like? What is your retirement plan? I think when we analyze what this actually is, it's a pretty heavy question. Uh, Interesting enough, you know, most people I know are actually retired in one way, shape or form. And it kind of blows my mind because I think there's levels of retirement. There's a period where many people start to disengage with the ability to even make money. So when I look at my friends and my family, I would say uh, there's very few people who are connected to work and still working on their wealth. And now that's an interesting statement. I'm 46 years old and my peers are either retired, there is a few proportion of people who are still working and investing, Then there is people who have tapped out. They have already resigned to the fact that they're either going to hit the pension or, you know what, they might as well just get out of this idea of wealth creation altogether and become sort of more altruistic, hippie vibe uh, retirees, if you like. So when it comes to the number... I think everyone's number is going to be different. Now, I obviously advocate the five cities, five properties plan because I know mathematically if you end up with five core assets that you own outright, it's going to spit out a lot of cash flow and that cash flow is going to take care of you. It's going to take care of your partner. It could potentially take care of your kids. It will create a legacy for you. It will design a magical life. And, you know, if I was to use an example of what that might look like, you know, I always use the example, if you can get to $2 million worth of assets and have them paid off, it's going to spit out $100,000 plus for you to retire, which is well above the pension system and well above what most economists advocate as the magic number. The magic number that, you know, a bank will forecast for people's retirement to live a really quality life is per couple $60,000 per annum in retirement. Remember, the pension is $36,000 per annum in retirement. Uh, A lot of... um, Government websites, banking websites will advocate around $60,000 in retirement. And I'm advocating, um, well, you know, if you can push even further through real estate, you know, you can do better than even what um, obviously large financial institutions like banks advocate for retirement. So what is enough and when is enough? That is a big question. What's uh, enough for me is different to you. I obviously don't want to go to Lake Guido. You might like camping alongside lakes. Um, so we're all different human beings and we're all on a different trajectory when it comes to how we finish this thing called investment real estate and investing in general. So I think there are definitely ways you can enter into the retirement sector. And I think we need to 
both work out how to design a life of retirement. And I'll talk about that. But also, what is enough? What is enough? Is a million dollars enough? A million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, and certainly, a million dollars can throw out five, six, seven percent yield if you work out how to play with that money right. So, most people I know are, uh, again, in a category of something to do with retirement. Now, I've got some really cool mates that are kind of like hippies and they smoke weed, they play drums, they're like really altruistic, they're really alternative. Uh, They're in their 30s and some of them are now hitting their 40s and I would say they're already retired. Now, they go to work a couple of days a week, they do sort of weird, not weird jobs, like just, just jobs that they like, right? But they're not career people. They're not full-time workers. And really, the money they make basically pays for that week. And they're very happy. They spend three days a week surfing. Um, They cruise around. They're very minimalistic. They don't need a lot of stuff. They uh, basically just you know, live day to day, very nomadic lifestyle. And they are retired. When I speak to them, I'm like, you're a retiree. You work, you know, a couple of shifts a week um, doing a few things and, and you're a retiree. That, that's great. It's, it's amazing you've been able to enjoy uh, that maneuver because – the impact or the financial impact of what that life looks like later in life, you know, maybe it'll work out. Maybe the the stress-free, you know, uh, non-career, non-investment dynamic will work out. I don't know, but I can 100% sure those people who are my friends and I assure them that the pension is where they're headed to. And uh, they're cool with that. Because they're actually almost like um, making that money now and they're at the prime of their life. So I have uh, basically six different groups of what I classify people in retirement. And the first group is the hippie retiree. Um, they're great people. I love, I love hanging out with them because they're just so chilled and they don't really give a shit about anything. I don't know what's going to happen to them when they um, have a big financial problem, like they need a new car, but it doesn't seem to bother them getting, um, you know, the bus for three hours across Sydney. Uh, That would bother me. I would not be cool with that. I don't want to sit on a bus for three hours across Sydney. The next uh, investor group, that I see in retirement. And a lot of my friends are retired. Like, you got to understand, like, um, you know, and I'll explain why I'm not retired after this, after I explain the six type of retirees, if you like. First retiree, hippie, um, you know, retiring blatantly before the age of retirement. Good on them. Uh, The next retiree is what I call the erosion investor. They are basically investors which get to a certain number and then uh, they quit their traditional job, their traditional career, and they decide it's basically time to just blow the lot. And so they create a nest egg. They uh, create a... They've had a career, they create a nest egg, and then they just start to bucket list the hell out of life. And what they do, the erosion investor gets kind of like a little part-time job. Um, My barista at my local cafe is an erosion investor. He he basically um, is around 55 years of age. Uh, He's working just to make a little bit of money, and he's got out of the more financial services business that he comes from. And he's basically just eroding the lot. And that's cool as well. Like I'm like, mate, at least you're, at least you know what you want. You're going for it. You're burning the lot. Um, and so what an erosion investor is, it's 
basically they liquefy their investments and they, you know, they basically draw down on their investments until there's nothing left. And uh, openly, an erosion investor will end up on the pension. They are basically uh, almost like retired now, if you like. Like, I know they go to work, but they're retired. They are retired. They are not trying to win the Nobel Peace Prize. They're not trying to scale up a business. They're, you know, they're not trying to build their career. They're they're re- going the opposite direction, and it's not to play a hate on anyone who's doing that. I don't want to be accused of that. I'm just explaining what happens when we get to a point where we go. You know what? We can't either do this create financial freedom or, uh, you know, we're just going to, or we're going to continue to create financial freedom. Um, the next, I guess, investor that, that I see is the glider, right? The glider is basically someone who's made some good investment decisions and then, uh, simply starts to go, well, um, I could get a part-time job. My investment's pay a proportion, I could start a side hustle um, and all of a sudden I can glide if I can just juggle. And, you know, gliders, I, I'm, I'm, I'm down with the glide, man. Like the glide is, you know, a uh, part-time job, uh, you know, little eBay store, um, you know, the glide is, uh, you know, doing doing the markets on the weekend, selling olives and uh, haberdashery. The glide is, you know, two investment properties. One of them uh, paid off the other one, and now you're getting some rental return. One of my best friends is a glider, um, and he basically bought a property in the Sydney property market some 20 years ago. Obviously, um, he's been able to pay that off. He gets a fair amount of rent for it, something like about $1,200 a week, um, which is good. He's getting 50 grand out of his investment, which is fabulous, right? And don't underestimate, there's a lesson there. You know, the higher your property can rent for, you know, the easier it is to just handle one property. Um, He's a glider. He basically does a few odd jobs around the place. He's got a bit of a part-time job and, uh, you know, sells a few things here and there. Glides through it, man. And and he's not, he's, he's retired. Like, even though he does this kind of basic, like, work, it's, it's more uh, for him just, you know, entertainment. Um, same with the erosion investor, my barista. It's just entertainment, something to do for the day. It's not working per se it's not like back breaking work he's not like you know a bricky like shoving bricks on a house or you know a, an executive where he's going to make a critical decision that afternoon or six people are going to lose their job it's it's uh for him he's he's you know what i would call a glider man he's he's gliding through this thing um the next investor which is a lean investor a lean investor, you know, you often hear conversations around lean investors. They basically can live a frugal, minimalist lifestyle. Um, and for them, really the magic number is a million dollars. A million dollars throws out roughly about $50,000 in cash flow. And that minimalist investor can then go, you know what, I'm Lake Guido. I'm doing the $16 caravan um, and I'm cool with that. And again, I think, you know, I I pick on the lean investor. I pick on Lake Guido. I'm just, you know, having some fun with it. But, you know, in all honesty, I don't want to end up at Lake Guido. I want to push a little bit further. And that's just me, right? And I'm no better than the lean investor. I'm just explaining, you know, the investment uh, I guess classifications, right? So lean investor, it doesn't need uh, two million dollars worth of real estate paid off. They need about a million dollars worth of real estate um, paid off because what they're going to do is actually rent a cheaper property. They're not going to wear you know nice 
nicer clothing. They're not going to fall for, you know, Nikes. They're going to buy the the weird, you know, $25 shoes or whatever. And no doubt, you know, you're walking past many lean investors in the street and you're going, man, that that dude, uh, you know, he, his dress sense is not very cool. Um, but, mate, who cares, right? For him, he doesn't care or her. He's the lean investor. Then there's the freedom investor. And the freedom investor is really what I try and coach people to do is to get to financial freedom. Basically, financial freedom is the principle that you're going to own more realist, well, more wealth than the uh, than the advertised average. And remember, the pension is thirty six thousand per couple. Uh, the advertised by like ASIC, um, you know, uh, you know, the government uh, is you'll have a lot lovely retirement as per couple with sixty thousand. I'm going for freedom investing, which is $100,000 plus. Then uh, you have the professional investor. And again, the professional investor is still investing when they're in retirement. And a lot of my friends today are actually professional investors. Professional investors, um, you know, they, they live in these beautiful places. They you know, living in Byron Bay, they're living Avalon Beach, they're living uh, in Hunters Hill. They basically have so much wealth and they uh, basically can still use that wealth without leverage, without needing to borrow more money and make cash investments into ideas, scale up opportunities, start up opportunities, uh, small business opportunities, uh, real estate development syndication opportunities. And really, they're just working their money as a professional investor, but they're, they're fundamentally retired. They're playing golf, uh, you know, talking on the phone, going, yep, I'm in for 200 So there is this scale, right? You've got the hippie retiree, which is plenty of my mates, um, love them to death. They're, uh, they're not stressed. They're going surf. They're surfing now while I'm doing this. You got the glider investor, which is basically, you know, someone who's, you know, you know, sort of a proportionate, um, you know, uh, they got a part time job and they've got a few things on the go, um, and they've got a few bit of money in in retirement. So they juggle a few things. They glide along. The erosion investment is just blowing the lot, basically. The lean investor is a frugal person. You won't see them at dinner. They, uh, when they're at dinner, they're like dividing up the bill. You know that that's the the lean investor. Oh, you know, I'm I'm uh, you know my proportion of the uh, of the um, you know the mixed seafood platter was twelve dollars fifty. The lean investor. Then you got the freedom investor, which is what I coach, which is this more ability to end up on passive cash flow from real estate and if you are going for freedom investing it takes a lot longer than for example to become a lean investor or an a uh, glider investor or certainly a hippie investor right and again the different people i see in retirement are all at different stages of what that ultimately means for me i am uh certainly capable of going into freedom and professional investing. And the only reason I still work, I guess, is I really enjoy what I do and there is a lot of unfinished business in my world. I think the best thing about being alive is you get to create your own movie. Um, and certainly, you know, what does wealth mean to me? It means you are the director of your own film. And I just love the fact that with real estate, I'm capable of helping other people, but also I'm seeing new frontiers in real estate, which for me is really part of my legacy plan is to help people understand green economics with real estate, um, to leave the world a better place than when I came to it. Uh, to impact the planet positively through real estate 
and to help other people basically see, succeed. So, you know, I've got this kind of hashtag people, place and planet. Um, and yeah, you know, now I'm like designing clothes, people, place and planet. That's my new thing. So I'm kind of enjoying what I'm doing is the only reason I don't opt out into f- as a freedom investor. Fundamentally, if I cashed out all of my real estate, um, sold half of it to pay off the other half, uh, well and truly uh, could easily, easily, uh, you know, um, walk away with uh, a, a freedom space and actually professionally invest, okay? And so it's just where I am in my life. It's taken my whole entire life to get there, but it's it allows obviously life choices um, as I move forward through this thing called wealth creation. So the first rule of this uh, conversation is you got to give up on the bullshit economics, right? Bullshit economics. What I love about my hippie retiree mates, they're not bullshit economic people. They don't fucking talk about like buying $400 worth of Bitcoin. They're already out, man. They're already hippies down surfing. They, they're, they're cool. Um, like, you're either going to just just pick one, be a hippie retiree, be a glider investor, be an erosion investor, just go for it and spend the lot, be a lean investor and, you know, just work out how to leverage your life differently, Le- live a leaner life so you don't have to invest as hard or be a freedom investor and eventually, if you really want to go for it, become a professional investor. So uh, I really like the idea of you, you ultimately um, choosing something and going for it. And I think, you know, what is enough is a big conversation. What is enough for a hippie investor, uh, a glider investor, erosion investor, a lean investor, freedom investor and professional investor is completely different. Professional investors, you want a net worth of certainly, um, you know, over, in my view, $5 million. Um, I know ASIC describes professional investors and sophisticated investors with a net worth over, I think it's over 2.5 mil. But um, yeah, it's a completely different playbook to perhaps someone who doesn't even want to go to that space. And that's cool as well. So what is enough? I think we've worked that out. You had a minimalist investment space. If you want to be a lean investor, I think a million dollars is the playbook. Uh, And I think, you know, a lot of people I coach are in between freedom investors and lean investors. And they they don't know which one they should be. And I'm just flagging it. You got to choose um, because no one knows you like you. When is enough is probably an even more challenging question. And I think um, you need to to really start to design your life through your journey so you do know when enough is enough. And again, going back to my hippie mates, like they are some of the funnest people I know. They, they do all – like the other parts of their life other than the financial part are amazing, Right. So you need a bit of a blueprint and I think you need to design it. And I see a lot of people um, struggle with this kind of part of it, right, is that they don't actually have any dreams. They don't know what work, uh, life after work actually looks like and therefore don't really have the balls to even stop working. And I say that because you're going to need some kahunas to actually go, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready. This is enough is enough. I'm happy doing some part-time work as a barista and uh, living off my life savings or I'm happy happy to erode it or I'm happy to to glide around and see what comes up. Uh, You're going to have to choose. And again, you've got to know your number. And if you don't know your mathematical number of what's right for you, You'll never know when to get off the treadmill. And when you don't know when to get off the treadmill, um, you 
stay on the treadmill. And one of the reasons most people don't get off the treadmill is they don't know how to design their life. They don't design enough hobbies in their life, enough family connections in their life. They don't create the right health environment in their life. And so they don't know how to design it. And I see this a lot with men. Men uh, really struggle with retirement because uh, quite often with men, the purpose of, of their, their, I guess, uh, you know, blueprint was, uh, and, and who they are or who they think they are mentally is an association with what they do, right? I'm a doctor. I'm a, I'm a real estate agent. I'm a, you know, plumber. I'm a, so this kind of association that, that men get, um, you know, because men aren't as, I, I guess, almost like, uh, open as women. And I think, you know, many women are great because they, you know, they can make friends easier. They're very open to, you know, community and things like that. And then I quite, quite often see that a lot of men, uh, you know, go into their shell, they go into their man cave and the man cave could be in their head or literally a cave. And, uh, you know, they spend their weekends tinkering about with, you know, some, you know, weird little mechanical device instead of, you know, other things, right? And that's what gets them off. That's cool. But I think you've got to design what retirement actually looks like and when you're going to retire and what you're going to do. And if you don't, I guess, start to map this stuff out, I think a lot of people, uh, even worse than uh, all the brave people that do enter retirement, is people that get stuck just working way too long and then, you know, they miss the whole thing. They they end up overweight and and mentally strained and don't actually love themselves enough to go, you know what, I, I, I need to do something else with my life, right? And what are, you know, what, if you don't know your dreams after work, then you've got to start working on that stuff. And a lot of people don't, it's not weird not to know. I'm just explaining. These are some of the things I think you should start mapping out and you need to design them. Now I'm going to give my friend a plug. Uh, my friend, Marcus Pierce, wrote a book. It's called Your Exceptional Life. And, uh, you know, you can, you can go to Amazon, no doubt, or um, Google Your Exceptional Life. Make the rest of your life the best of your life by Marcus Pierce and buy his book. It's got uh, even Dr. D. Martini, Dr. John D. Martini has given this a plug. This book is a masterpiece for creating a magnificent life. So I think, you know, one of the challenges we have when it comes to getting off the off the treadmill is not knowing how to get off the treadmill. Now, I can tell you I am not a master of the exceptional life blueprint, but other people are, and all I simply do is hang around with other people who are so I can get fed that type of information to actually end up absolutely living the right life and working out how to retire and, of course, how to live a much more functional and enjoyable retirement. So you got to plan what it looks like. When do you want to stop? You've got to work that out. Mathematically, that is an equation. If you've got 10 years of investment left as opposed to 30, that actually impacts the type of properties you buy or the investment decisions you make or the vehicle you buy real estate in. It could be better to buy real estate in your super than in your own name. And I think it's really common for many people to get to the latest status of their life or stage of their life. And particularly couples, you know, one couple's stopped work, worked out their life. The other couple, the other uh, partner, if you like, is still working. And that always makes my mind boggle, right? I, you know, probably sound like I'm judgmental, but I'm just trying to explain, like, you got to map this stuff out so that you do know when to call it quits. And I think the best way to do that 
is what I call my two-touch rule. Um, you know, we understand there is this concept known as the wheel of life, right? The wheel of life, it's easy to Google, go Google it. It's basically uh, a pie chart where you, you know, you take segments of your life and you rank, you know, oh, I'm really good at money, but I'm not very good at family and friends, or I'm really good at community, uh, I'm not very good at money. And you kind of start to map out, you know, which bits you're good at and you've got nailed and which bits you struggle at. Now, for me, I've obviously got the money part, you know, fairly well nailed. But I call this the two-touch rule, which is simply for the next 10 years of your life, each week you've got to touch these two parameters twice a week. You've got to touch these parameters twice a week. And again, go get Marcus's book, The Exceptional Life Blueprint. Give it a read. Um, start mapping out the rest of your life. Uh, you know, as he says here, make the rest of your life the best of your life. But for me, um, I want to examine my money two times a week. And how do I do that? I do courses, I read on money. I, uh, you know, I'm constantly educating myself when it comes to financial well-being. I think from a career point of view, obviously most people, if they are getting growth in a career, you know, they're touching that um, because they simply go to work, right? Health and fitness, you absolutely want to have at least two touch points on this a week. You know, you want to design your life around um, having healthy hobbies, having healthy fitness dynamics. You want to be able to, you know, again, at least twice a week, um, you know, be, be making sure you're working on this part. I think, Fun and recreation, again, same principle. At least twice a week you want to be doing something which is aiding your, you know, world when you retire. And, and I look at uh, certainly everyone I know who's retired and the recreation part of retirement is really a big, big component. My hippie mates, you know, when they're not doing two shifts a week, they're surfing. Um, when, you know, my professional investor mates are not, uh, you know, professionally investing as an investor, they're doing a lot of recreation, a lot of things, right? So you want this sort of two touch rule where I think you're designing your life before you enter this thing called retirement. You want to be able to have a good relationship with your family and friends, go and see them twice a week, call them twice a week. Uh, you want this, you know, really good dialogue with your partners, you know, um, or the person you love, right? You know, go to two dates a week, man. It's not that hard. Just you've got to enter this place where your match fit to actually do this thing called retirement because, again, a lot of people just don't end up going into retirement, finding their passion projects, and having a fun retirement. A lot of people die in retirement because retirement is not what, uh, not cut out. They're not cut out for what the boredom of not having anything to do actually is in retirement. And of course, a lot of people are scared of retirement and that's why they work way uh, longer than they should because of purpose, this thing called purpose. So, You've got to work this stuff out. The only way to work it out, in my view, is to get match fit. But hey, I'm no expert. It's just what I do. Go and read The Exceptional Life Blueprint by Marcus Pierce and you'll start to, um, you know, work out the rest of your life and make the rest of your life the best of your life. Um, I advocate that we only get one life, so you've got to have 10 of them. And I certainly look at, how I've led my life and I've had 10, at least five versions of it. Uh, and I plan to have another five versions before I'm extinct. And what that looks like for me, I, I can tell you is, you know, lots of, uh, you know, different adventures and certainly, you know, big, big goal of mine is, is to go again and, and spend some time in another country and, work and live from another country doing this thing called real estate. 
I absolutely think you can map out something amazing, which is without question, you know, a suitable, um, you know, way to live your life. Now, the great thing about being Australia is you can always plan a plan B and Australians are lucky. Like we're honestly, from a wealth point of view, compared to the rest of the world, we are just absolutely so wealthy. So you can always do money arbitrage, which, you know, if, um, again, just talking about changing your state and world and and just going for it um, and, you know, having 10 lives in one, well, I think we've all seen the movie the best exotic marigold hotel where basically old people from England decide to go and live in India and, you know, spend the lot. Well, I can tell you, you can go and live in Indonesia, you can go and live in Bali and get a, uh, basically a retiree visa and live uh, as long as you can show you earn over 18 thousand dollars us per annum you can actually go and live in a completely different country now obviously completely different rules uh, obligations health care you name it it's completely different but i prior to coronavirus being around i mean i'd go to bali for the weekend i love bali that much it was it was something i was constantly place i was constantly going to um and you know I met so many sort of pensioner retirees there that that basically have decided to live the marigold lifestyle and all power to them. At least they're making a decision, you know. Uh, they're not the wealthiest people, but they're living a really, really good life. And again, I think, you know, I'm trying to get to people to this thing called uh, investor freedom. Uh, and people to a professional investor. But at a bare minimum, you know, it would be great to get um, investors to to a place where they've got enough uh, financial horsepower but also wellness horsepower to, to re- live the rest of their life well, right? And, you know, for me, real estate is the best vehicle, right? It absolutely is, um, I think. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of people that buy real estate are all obsessed with this thing called capital growth, but it's actually the cash flow that you end up living off, right? And I think uh, no matter your budget, there's a way to create cash flow out of real estate. I teach 13 cash flow strategies which people are going to adopt. Whether you own one property or 10 properties, there's ways to inject money into the market and turn that money into cash flow so you can live the rest of your life uh, in a great state and you can take care of things like leisure and hobbies, social events, health activities, medical expenses, home expenses. Uh, You can take care of the fact that Australians are going to live a long time. Most Australians, barring incident, may live to around 90, which means you need a lot of money You need a lot of uh, activity to get you there and you need certainly a lot of hobbies and uh, community to to make sure you're enjoying what you do to live the longest possible life but also the best possible life. And, of course, you know, at some point when you get really old, you may actually need even more money for, you know, things like, uh, you know, hospitalization um, and and care, right? So money absolutely allows you to look after yourself and uh, certainly I think, you know, however you want to choose to lead your life, a little bit of investment goes a long way. A lot of investment goes a very long way. And certainly if Lake Weirdo's for you, this one's for you, don't be shy to make that your dream For me, it's certainly not. I want to go a little bit higher than Lake Weirdo. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends 
and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.